So we'll get started. Hello and welcome to this week's ISAG webinar, which will focus on the scientific evidence for why we should and how we can reopen our schools safely. The Independent Scientific Advocacy Group, ISAG, is a multidisciplinary group of scientists, ac uh, academics and researchers who've come together to advocate for SARS-CoV-2 elimination um, on the island of Ireland. We have a really fantastic lineup for today's seminar or webinar, um, and we're delighted to have um, a guest um, chair today. Um, Gary Gannon is TD for Dublin Central. He's a member of the Social Democrats and he's their spokesperson on education, social protection, media, tourism, arts, culture, and the Gaeltacht and sport. So Gary, I'll hand over to you. Thanks a million, Claire. And let me just say from the outset, it's absolutely, it's a real honor to be here. I think this is a very important and timely discussion in relation to the reopening of schools safely. Um, the conversation over the past couple of months has been taken up by how we reopen skills and often lost in that urgency is the idea that we need to reopen them safely. And I think that conversation today is very timely in that manner because it's being lost. I think there's a, a wealth of excellent speakers here I'm excited to, to hear from. And it's timely also in the case that the Minister Norma Foley will be in the doll today. So I'm hoping to relay some of the discussion that happens straight to the Minister today following the presentation. So. I don't want to take up too much time because I know there's going to, going to be a lot of questions afterwards. So I'm going to hand over to our first contributor, who is Mr. Paul Dempsey, a mathematical scientist. Paul. And thanks, thanks, Gary. Um, so just a quick situation update. First of all, looking at Northern Ireland, looking at the age breakdowns, we can again see this week that the over 80s in, in Northern Ireland are performing better than everybody else. And, very suggestive of a strong vaccine impact from starting from when they uh, vaccinated 80% of their home cares back um, at the start of the year. Everybody else is going still in the right direction there in Northern Ireland, so no, no real concerns there. In the Republic, we have had seen a vaccine impact, or at least appears to be vaccine impact among our H, our healthcare workers, where they've dropped very considerable since um, the start of well the middle of January the start of January here is a bump mainly because there was no less lack testing over Christmas so that's exaggerating it but from here down to here we also had a general decline in, in the total populations um, it's not quite as optimistic as we would have hoped on the start of the, start of the year um, but there's a, a few reasons for that not just cl close contact testing would explain some degree of it but not at all when we look at the age profile cases, though, there's been a, a quite a, a big shift in the Republic. The over 65s, and this is mainly driven by the younger cohort of that, the 65 to 75 year olds have plummeted in their case numbers. But we're seeing more and more cases in the, in the, the one to four age group and the five to 14 age groups. And um, steadying as well in the 15 to 34, the middle group as well. When we're looking at things that have changed since before Christmas, and one of the things that's changed is the rate of hospitalization in the younger age groups, whereas before it was around one to one and a half percent of cases, depending on the group. It's nearly doubled since B117 has, has arrived on the scene. Um, when we look at B117, we've, we've seen before how in, in, from NEFIT briefings as well, the percentage of cases are more and more of this new variant, the British, the, the Kent variant, B117. Um, and we try and model this with uh, certain values to see that we pretty much got rid of all of the variants we had before Christmas, and it's, we're just left with nearly all B117. Uh, if B117 didn't have any transmission advantage, we would be in a situation now, a very happy situation, where we would nearly have eliminated, eliminated COVID again. It would be very much within control, and we could have done a full planned, proper reopening like we tried to do again, with the same visa of, of making sure we have uh, hotel quarantines and, and other controls and what can come in. We've still plenty of room, even with B117, to, to reduce down. Last April, when we had more and more people working from home, especially in, say, the public sector, where it seems to be a lot more of return to work, um, we, we have a lot of room there to push back and maybe half, in, in say, in Dublin, some of the rates. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you very much. 
Oh, thanks a million. Um, folks on the call, folks who are joining us, just today there is the opportunity to ask questions and answers. If you want to place them into the Q&A function down below the chat, we will get to as many as we possibly can at the end of the four presentations. So please use the Q&A for any questions you might have. So our first speaker today, well, the second speaker, but the first of the invited guests are Dr. Deepthi Gurdasani, is a clinical epidemiologist and statistical genesis. He was currently senior lecturer in machine learning at the William Harvey Research Institute, Barts and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry at Queensmere University of London. Dr. Gurdasani has earned a large following for her ability to simplify complex data and to address myths about COVID-19 that arise from gaps and biases in the, evid in the evidence. She's gonna tell us about some of these in her talks myths and mitigation, opening skills without mitigation, risk losing and control of the pandemic. Dr. Gerda Sani, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thank you. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, yes you can. Okay, so um, <clears throat> essentially what I want to do today is run uh, us through some of the evidence around childhood transmission and how um, misinterpretation of this evidence widely has sort of resulted in a big gap between what the evidence tells us and policy and how we can attempt to bridge this. Um, so just to introduce some key concepts around childhood transmission, we hear a lot about probably three words in this. So there's susceptibility, which means how likely will a person be infected with the same level of exposure, the level of exposure, so how many contacts you have, how exposed are you to the virus in what settings, and transmissibility. Once you get the virus, how likely are you to transmit uh, to other people in the same sort of environment? Um, we've heard a lot about children being less susceptible, potentially less susceptible to the virus. And this is something there's a lot of uncertainty about. But one thing to remember is the role of schools in transmission or the role of children in transmission depends on all three factors. So you could potentially be less susceptible to the virus, but have huge amounts of exposure in certain environments like schools and actually transmit much more and still be uh, responsible for a lot of community transmission. And that's something to remember. So in some ways, these sort of uh, different uh, concepts are not as important as understanding the composite impact of school openings and closure on community transmission, because that's essentially what should inform policy. Um, so why studying this challenging? I think one of the biggest problems is that children often have mild or asymptomatic infection and may not get tested to the same extent that adults do, which would lead to a huge underestimation of cases in children and transmission in children. And I'll show some real examples of this. Uh, the second is that, um, you know, the, the symptoms in children can be different to those in adults. And a lot of our symptom-based testing relies on standard symptoms for COVID that may not apply to children. And many children are not eligible based on those criteria. And often when we do identify symptomatic infection, it's identified in contacts of the children who are infected. So perhaps adults in a household or teachers in a classroom, and we misattribute those people being the index cases when in fact it may have been a child who transmitted to them who went undetected. Uh, we also know that, for example, false negatives and swab based tests are higher in children, potentially because of difficulty in doing these tests. Seropositivity also wanes much faster in children over time, largely because many of them are asymptomatic and have mild infection. So looking at serological studies and comparing them to adults is also not a good way to estimate infection in them. This means that many studies that rely on symptomatic transmission are biased. And if you look at the studies that are cited repeatedly, repeatedly to say transmission isn't happening in schools, they tend to rely on symptomatic transmission. Um, and overall, we need to remember transmission is context dependent. So when we look at studies, we need to look at the context. Were schools open or closed during that period? What was the level of attendance in schools? Uh, were there mitigatory measures in schools, in which case the data may not be generalizable to a setting where there aren't mitigatory measures in schools, and what was the background community transmission. So an example of a study that's repeatedly been taken out of context is an early public health England study uh, by Ishmael et al, which was uh, studied about 20,000 children in England in June, and identify very little infection among those children. First of all, that study was based on symptom-based testing, but second, it was carried out in a period where only 7% of children were attending schools. So definitely not something that could have been used to interpret um, school-based transmission. So how do we study this? Um, there are a number of different studies. Um, 
One of my favorites are what I call ecological studies. So these are studies that look at school openings and closures in different parts of the world, which have occurred at different points of time, along with other measures that occurred, and try and tease out what was the impact of school openings or closure on R. In some way, this gives us a composite measure of the impact of school openings and closures on transmission, which is what we're interested in, in terms of policy. And it kind of uh, sort of goes over all those biases of studies uh, that are based on symptom-based transmission, because we essentially look at the impact of school openings or closure on R rates in the community. The second sort of study is household contact studies, which look at susceptibility and transmissibility. So again, uh, a lot of these have been biased because of symptom-based assessment of indexness and uh, caseness in children. Seroprevalence studies have already outlined the problems with these. And another way to look at this is, are teachers and parents more prone to infection? So I'm going to start looking at the first line of evidence, ecological studies. So here's a study that was actually published in Nature Human Behavior, which looked at thousands of non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions over hundreds of countries and tried to rank the interventions by impact on R and essentially found that closure of education institutions had a huge impact on reducing R. It was a second most effective intervention. And of course, education institutions is a very broad category, but when you break this down, uh, you find that the impact of primary, secondary, and preschool setting closures was quite similar, and all of them led to an about 0.2 reduction in R. Um, and because they were looking at many, many different interventions and took a lot of care to really tease these out in different parts of the world, it's unlikely to be confounded by several interventions happening together. This is another study published in The Lancet that looked across 130 countries and showed that the impact of uh, school closure and opening, again, had a substantial effect on R. So we consistently see that uh, school closure reduces R by 20% and opening schools conversely increased R by about 20%. And what, what do we know about the data from England? So this is something I've studied closely. And the reason I'm sort of focusing on this data is because in England, we have this, um, we're really lucky to have the Office uh, for National Statistics Infection Survey that actually surveys the general population, about 100,000 people fortnightly. So it's not based on symptom-based testing and gives a much more unbiased picture of infection in different age groups than symptom-based uh, testing does, which is essentially what we have as per our routine um, uh, surveillance. And here, what we see in England is that infection in young uh, age groups, so in school uh, age groups and university students very closely mirrors opening of education institutions and closures. So the lines to look out for here are the red line, which is includes primary school children, uh, but not just primary school children, the orange line, which is secondary school children, and the pink line, which is year 12 to age 24. And, you know, we see, for example, schools open around this time, and we see rapid increases in infection in um, uh, the school age children and those attending university. We had half term and we see a drop in infection again in these age groups, that, which is somewhat mirrored in some groups in the community, but not all. Uh, and then we had a lockdown during which schools remained open. And what we see is continued sharp increases, particularly in secondary school children, but also in primary school children, uh, potentially mirrored in young adults who may, for example, be parents. And we see here that after schools closed in, on December 18th, um, first we see a peak of infections just after Christmas in primary school children and secondary school children. So this is the line marking the peak. And you see this is subsequently followed by a peak in all other age groups, suggesting that it's schools that are actually driving community transmission and the peak of infection in children is subsequently followed by the peak of infection in other age groups. Now, if we look at when uh, schools reopened, schools reopened for us uh, on the 4th of January and subsequently they remained open to limited students, but we had pretty high attendance in primary schools so around one in five students, one in four to one in five students have been attending in primary schools and secondary school attendance has been very low. And what you see clearly here is once schools reopen, you see a sharp rise again in primary school children, which is 
to a smaller extent than reflect in other age groups. If you look at secondary school children, the decline continues in line with very low attendance in this age group. So it's not just that we're seeing mirroring of uh, infection rates in schools and communities with school openings and closures, but also with actual attendance in schools. So just to make this clearer, this is data from the REACT-1 study from Imperial that actually showed that during this particular lockdown, infection rates are declining the slowest in the primary scale age group, uh, primary age, uh, uh, primary school age group, and uh, infection rates are some of the highest among this age group and in young adults. And this very closely mirrors what we're seeing in uh, Public Health England data on outbreaks. So this looks at the number of clusters that are identified in schools, again, based on symptom-based testing. And what we see here in green is Although the outbreaks in secondary schools have hugely reduced in line with the attendance being only 5%, we're still seeing outbreaks in nursery settings and in primary school settings in line with primary school settings still having attendance of about one in four. So very good data suggesting that um, school attendance makes a big difference. And just to show that you know, if we were if we didn't have this Office for National Statistics data, if we were looking only at our actual data from confirmed cases, the picture would look very different and we would never pick this up. So this is the actual data based on cases who were detected by our symptom based testing. So not from the Office for National Statistics. And if you look at the primary scale age group, primary school age group, it's the one in yellow. And if you look at uh, secondary schools, it's the one in gray. And you don't see that sort of really high prevalence that we see almost throughout sort of December in these age groups here at all. They sort of seem like they have lower levels of infection than many other age groups that really show that the biases in, in these sort of studies, because this was actually done at the same time as the previous study that I showed. The only difference is that that's a random survey and this isn't. And moving on to what the Office for National Statistics data tells us when we look at household contact studies, which was done by the Office of National Statistics, the picture painted by this is very different to what's been reported from symptom-based studies. So while it suggests that relative susceptibility in uh, younger children and older children might be lower than adults, if you look at the exposure, it's much higher. So um, children from two to 12 years of age are two times more likely to be the first case in a household, so the index case in a household, and secondary school children are seven times more likely to be the first case in a household between April and December in England, uh, during which period, during some of the period schools were open, but there were restrictions, including <clears throat> lockdowns that applied on adults. And if you look at relative transmissibility, once these children are infected, they are two times more likely, both in primary school settings and secondary school settings, to uh, infect members of the household compared to those who are 17 plus years. So what are the other lines of evidence we have for this? Let's look at the risk of infection among teachers. So if we look at what happened in Sweden, um, uh, during periods of high infection at one point of time last year in their secondary school settings, um, lower secondary school teachers were attending schools in person, whereas upper, I think it's the other way around, sorry, lower secondary school, um, yeah, were attending in person while upper secondary school children were uh, learning remotely. So it, this was a similar age groups, but we had teachers who were doing remote schooling only and teachers who were doing in-person schooling only for similar age groups. And in this study, what we find is that the uh, odds ratio of getting infection was two times higher in children, who, uh, in, in teachers who were teaching in person versus teachers who were teaching remotely. And this um, infection rate actually spilled over to their partners as well with about a 30% higher risk. We also see that parents of children who were attending in school <clears throat> had a higher risk of infection than those who were attending remotely. Uh, moving on to data from England. So in England, again, this is REACT2 data that came out on 25th February that looks at zero prevalence data in different occupations. And what we find here is that these in unvaccinated education workers, we see a risk of about 11.4% of zero prevalence versus uh, people who are not key workers who have about 7.8% risk. This difference is statistically significant. And if we look at Primary and secondary school teachers, zero prevalence, again, very similar. So, you know, it's a myth that primary school teachers are less likely to be exposed. 
if we look at the Office for National Statistics infection data, so this is not zero prevalence data. This is uh, essentially uh, how likely were they uh, were these different occupations to have a positive PCR test uh, between uh, September to January. Uh, we find that although these are not all statistically different, but we find a pretty high prevalence, about 6% in teaching professions, and they definitely occupy the upper part of the ranking, even though those those um, it's a continuum and, and, and these are not statistically different. Um, of course, the big question is, what can we do about this? Uh, you know, it's clear transmission is happening in schools, but do mitigatory measures help and is there any evidence for these? This is a paper that actually just came out yesterday from John Hopkins and is based on a symptom-based survey that recruits about half a million people every week. Uh, and based on a very large sample, it's essentially looked at parents of uh, children who are attending full-time in-person and part-time in-person schooling in different age groups. And we see that there is, um, so we look at different symptoms, COVID likeliness, which is the standard symptoms of COVID, a more specific symptoms like loss of taste and smell, and whether they tested positive on a PCR test. And essentially we find that um, in terms of testing, all children, uh, whether you look at you know, primary age groups or secondary age groups, parents are at higher risk of getting infected if their children are in, in person schooling, then uh, you know, similar risk in, in uh, population uh, who's who don't have children uh, or whose children are not in schooling. And if you look at how this changes with mitigatory measures, you can see that uh, these are the mitigatory measures that were studied and they sort of looked at the response by different numbers of mitigatory measures. And you can see that this risk can be brought down to fairly similar to the general population by adopting multiple mitigations. So single mitigations are not sufficient. We need multi-layered approaches because it's a dose response. As you add more and more layers of protection, the risk comes down lower and lower and more equal to what you expect in the general population. So it's very clear that mitigatory measures have an impact. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of this has been widely misunderstood by our government and scientific advisors. And we are now in England, at least opening schools on the 8th of March to um, all children without very much more mitigation. And what do we expect to happen? Um, so this is a model by uh, the London School of Hygiene that was published recently in a preprint and uh, showed that in almost all scenarios and assumptions, R will rise above one once uh, schools open. And um, you know people feel that vaccination will mitigate this, but this is a model from Warwick and there's similar models from Imperial College as well that has looked at this in England. And even with vaccine rollout continuing at a fast rate, that's between three to 4 million per week, uh, and, you know, even with the considering the impact of seasonality, if that exists, we will still see at least in the most conservative scenario, 30,000 additional deaths. And this is because we know that vaccination is not going to have a huge impact on transmission. If transmission is allowed to continue alongside, we will see many more cases, exponential rises. R will rise above one. We will see many more hospitalizations and many more deaths in those people who haven't been vaccinated, as well as in people who have been vaccinated with a single dose without full uh, efficacy. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And uh, our roadmap for lockdown doesn't have a test to actually keep transmission low. It's based on not breaching NHS capacity rather than uh, keeping R and transmission low, which is really problematic because we're sort of accepting this number of deaths. Um, and that's very clear and implicit in the plan. Okay, <laughs> in addition to all this, we also have a new variant to add to the mix. And it's very clear that we're seeing outbreaks in schools, including in daycare settings and primary schools in many parts of the world where B117 is becoming prominent. I think we've all heard about the huge outbreak in Italy, uh, in a town where 60% of the cases were attributed to young children in daycare. Um, and similar ones in Israel, Denmark, and more recently in Canada as well. And we need to remember that we have real world evidence for this. So in last November, when England was in lockdown and our schools were open, the cases with the new variant were rising with an R of 1.4. So we have real life evidence of what's happened when we've done this before. And just a reminder, when we opened cases and uh, opened schools in September last year, at this point in time, when we were having about 3000 cases a day in England, and within, and of course, cases were rising before this, but gradually, but it accelerated the pandemic. And within four weeks, 
cases quadrupled. And we are now opening schools at a much higher level. We have about 8,000 to 10,000 cases occurring daily. So the impact of this is likely to be huge unless we take measures to prevent this. So just to summarize, children and schools contribute substantially to transmission, potentially because of the high contact rates that they have that link many different households together. And transmission is a composite of many factors that may be context dependent. So we can potentially mitigate this. Um, there is uncertainty around susceptibility and transmissibility of different age groups, but it's clear that both primary and secondary schools and even preschool settings contribute substantially to transmission. And evidence is sadly widely misunderstood even by scientific advisors. Um, so in terms of impact of transmission, I think I don't need to really go through this. I think we all know that it has a huge impact on community transmission, but we need to remember this is a virus we don't understand very well. We are seeing long-term complications in adults and in children, the Office for National Statistics data suggests that 12 to 15% of children in primary and secondary school settings develop persistent symptoms for five weeks or more. We don't understand what this means in terms of pathology, reversibility, and we should really adopt the precautionary principle here. Um, and of course, destruction of education. I mean, people have been off school for many months now, if you consider the period from March. And the reason for this is not um, COVID or lockdown. The reason for this is because we haven't been able to contain COVID. And I think that's what we have to remember. If you want to keep children in school, the best way to do this is to mitigate and to adopt el elimination strategies, even if they take a slightly longer time, because in the long term, it means children have undisrupted education. In England, for example, in December, even when schools were open, only 80% of children were in schools because many were isolating because somebody was ill. Um, so uh, I think we all know this. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but essentially our policies have been extremely hygiene focused, although there's much less evidence for hygiene trans based, I mean, sorry, for my transmission compared to aerosol transmission. We need to bring our guidance in, in line with CDC guidance, uh, which takes aerosol transmission into account. There's very good guidance recently available on ventilation. We need masks in primary and secondary schools. Millions of children are wearing masks in many different parts of Europe. This is recommended by the CDC. Um, and of course, we need smaller bubble sizes. Um, uh, a traffic light system that allows for hybrid remote teaching when infection rates get high in the background. We need to consider revising our vaccination policy because it's clear that overall risk is a composite of vulnerability and exposure, and we need to consider exposure as well. Um, and of course, we need to really support families and schools with this. They need a lot more investment to be able to take these measures because they shouldn't be left to fend for their own without appropriate guidance or investment. Um, yeah, so I think we need to stop giving schools and children special status because they're not special. Transmission occurs because they're crowded places uh, where a lot of people meet. Uh, and we need to take, adopt the precautionary principle because we don't understand the long-term impacts on children. It's important to tackle disinformation in this area, which is rife and is also being propagated by the scientific community. And we need to co-create policy with teachers and parents who are seeing the real life impacts of this on them. Um, and of course, evidence needs to be applied consistently across all settings. If we are asking uh, workplaces to adopt certain measures or other indoor environments to adopt certain measures, it makes no sense to not adopt them in schools. Um, sorry, I think I might have run over, but that's all I've got. Dr. Gurdasani, that was a um, really sober and, and well-presented analysis that certainly raises a lot of questions about our own approach to the reopening of schools here in Ireland. In relation to the questions, there is a number of questions coming through, but I might invite some of the other three speakers to contribute first and then take all the questions together, if that's okay, just to ensure we get a full um, presentation. Um, I'm going to pass over to Olive O'Connor, who is a member of the Parents United Ireland, a youth worker and a healthcare advocate. Olive is passionate about public and patient involvement in research and human rights issues especially those which concern the most vulnerable members of society. Olive is going to talk to us today about why there is nothing positive about positivity rates in skills. Olive, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Grzelani, for that. Um, we've followed you for a long time, and uh, I suppose the reason we have is because of our concerns uh, with schools and with um, children um, in general and our school staff um, especially. Uh, so today I'm here, um, I suppose, presenting um, 
a report we did. Uh, we are parents, um, school staff and children, and we are sharing a report we did to kind of highlight um, some of those kind of myths that um, Dr. Deepti was uh, discussing there and try to kind of find out what was actually happening in Ireland. So, um, I, yeah, that's great. It's working perfectly. Um, so I suppose um, for months in Ireland, you know, we've been told, like everyone else, you know, to keep two metres apart, to stay at home, to reduce our close contacts and to avoid crowded indoor spaces. And all of that seems to apply, except for, you know, when you have to go to school. And um, so we're also told, you know, when we go into school and we do all those things that we're actually safe. So I suppose we wanted to find out if this was true. Were schools actually safe? Um, but who are we to look into such matters? Because we're not uh, like most of the people here. We're not scientists. We're not epidemiologists or healthcare workers. We're not public health specialists or mathematicians. But we are people who matter when it comes to schools. And our members include, we're part of Parents United Ireland, um, our members include students and children, teachers and school staff, including school bus drivers and cleaners and administrators, principals. And um, we have parents, guardians and caregivers and their siblings and family members. Many of the members of our group are medically high risk or they um, live with or care for somebody who's high risk. Most of us are cocooning for the last year, including our family. We're acutely aware that most children in our group right now in Ireland cannot access remote learning from their public schools if they stay at home. And many school staff in our group are not allowed to work from the safety of their home. We have a mission. This is a once in a lifetime evolving global pandemic which has harmed and killed millions of people. And we really believe that no child should be excluded from access and education for public schools if they stay at home, nor should school staff be afraid that they will lose their jobs if they want to work from home to stay safe. We believe all people should be given the choice to be able to apply the same safety measures advised for the general public. We advocate for the safest school settings possible, especially for those who do need to attend. But currently in Ireland, we don't have that despite what we're told. So Deirdre was supposed to be here today. She was a great help in this report. And um, she, uh, I suppose, collated and collected all this information, a lot of information from Dr. D and uh, a lot of the members of ISAG. And um, it really ha helped open my eyes to see what actually was happening in the real world. Um, she's got a master's in journalism, a scholar in Trinity College, and uh, we've become really good friends over the last, uh, I'd like to say weeks, but now months since it's taken us that long. Um, myself, uh, I suppose I'm a youth leader. I absolutely love working with young people and teenagers. I'm a bit unique in the sciences that I uh, dip into with public patient involvement and patient experience specialists. Um, I am very, very um, a big core believer in experience based go design and public patient involvement, which basically means bringing everybody together, uh, their experiences and kind of combining that with data, statistics and uh, science. Um, but I'm also a mom to four gorgeous girls. Um, to your left, you're going to see a picture from a long time ago. Um, those girlings are not that size anymore. They're just a bit camera shy now. They are now 18, 17 and 14. And to the right is my, uh, she's now three, Madison. Uh, she's our surprise baby. Um, when you look at there, you know we all look really well and healthy, but actually all six of us have uh, complex medical health conditions. That wasn't always the case. In 2003, three of my daughters contracted swine flu from school. 12 years later, two of our girls still have life altering symptoms, which only started after they contracted swine flu. On the days when I had to inject chemotherapy drugs into my little girl's belly to help her swollen and painful joints, I cried. I never wanted to see anyone go through what she did. And I swore I'd, I swore I'd help anybody that would do that. In January 2020 last year, I heard about a new deadly virus. I did everything to tell people keep your children safe, keep yourselves safe. I went to national television, anyone that would listen, and I pleaded with them to keep children out of school until we knew more. Much like swine flu, much wasn't known about COVID-19 back then, and thankfully the government did close the schools until you know we figured it out. It was supposed to be temporary, they held it off until the 23rd of August. So schools were opening, I was thinking, what am I going to do with my children? But I was watching the data very, very closely. And locally, our cases were very low. And as I always say, if cases are low in the community, we're going to have lower in the schools. So what we decided we'll send two of our girls back. And um, we did that. And I kept an extremely close eye on the numbers. In October, I knew I had to make a decision to keep them home again. This was before any announcements or anything else. 
So I kept a close eye on the figures. Um, you can see here in the examiner, 54% of all cases happened in October, but this wasn't being told in an awful lot of places, but I was watching this. At the same time, I also found out that um, there was a case in my ch children's school a week after I pulled them out. And then I found out that I wouldn't necessarily have been told about that because there was a policy that you didn't have to be told if there was cases in the classroom or in the school. And had I known that, I would never have sent my children to school in the first place because they could have come home, potentially exposed that virus to the, the, for themselves, but also my little baby who's awaiting heart surgery. And that could have just been terrible. So I read up on all the policies. I started listening and talking to all the people who were going to schools, using schools, worrying about schools, not getting access. Our students, our teachers, our SNAs, our principals, worried about loved ones attending schools, grandparents, and those at risk from getting the virus. A lot of people, children live with people who are very high risk of getting this virus, but there was this big thing that children don't transmit it. So those children were told they had to go to school or they wouldn't get remote learning. This to me was, was just not okay in Ireland. And it, I suppose it kind of led to me looking into the bigger picture. You know, if a child with a high risk condition, they had to be very high risk to get this remote learning. But if they had asthma or diabetes, they may not necessarily get that. If they lived with extremely medically vulnerable people who were um, life limiting conditions, like really serious cancer, they weren't allowed access to remote learning. Pregnant and or medically high risk school staff were told they had to go to schools and they could not work from home even though they caught doctor's letters telling them they shouldn't go to work. Staff and students without health conditions who were very worried about the virus still had to go to school. The worst thing was hearing the stories. Because I'm an advocate, I got the calls, I got the messages, I got the emails. I heard stories from children. I have a pain in my tummy going into school. I have a pain in my tummy coming home from school, worrying about the virus. What if I give it to my mammy, my daddy, or my brother or sister? And I know mental health is so important for schools, but no child or adult should go to school feeling that way or coming home from school that way. With some of the biggest class sizes in Europe and no reduction in class sizes at all, students and staff have struggled to maintain one metre distance, never mind two metres, in classrooms and school buses, and masks are not recommended for primary school children. Staff and students said they're not told of cases in their classrooms or schools, and principals were told they could not close schools even if local transmission was high or there were outbreaks in their schools. Many parents and children wrote letters and I wrote my first report on the findings in November. We sent them off to the officials and children's organisations, but yet no changes were made. We received the usual response, schools are safe. Again said on the 11th of January, when Ireland recorded the highest number of positive cases per million people in the world, it was again said, schools are safe with thousands of parents, students and school staff, were they wrong in thinking they were unsafe? Like, you know, we can't have all been wrong. So we decided to find out. So what did we find? Uh, initially, not much, uh, because there wasn't a huge amount to go on. And then when we did find some data, we found that it was too difficult to disseminate, but we kept going. To give you an example of how hard this is, in Ireland, we have three different data sets. We have um, our daily data set, which is zero to four, five to 14, and then 15 and 18 year, old, 18 year olds are bracketed in with adults. We then have another data set, uh, which is usually on a weekly report or a school report, zero to four, five to 12, and 13 to 18, the age group we actually need, that's our school ages. And then on our school report, we have zero to 17 and 18 plus. So you can imagine how hard it is to disseminate that information and then uh, 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 I suppose compare it to, to itself. But we couldn't find how many cases happened in school aged children before schools opened compared to afterwards. Only for the little table that you can see at the top there. It was in the school report at the bottom. I looked at it and looked at it and I realised that if I actually took the bottom number, uh, 13143 from the top number, I would get the amount of cases for the beginning period before schools reopened. That's how it was left there for me. And the bottom table you see on your screen are the results. What we found were that there were 11,967 extra cases since schools reopened in children. And this is how it looked. This was the six months before schools reopened, 1,176 cases and 13,143 after schools reopened. Of all ages, we had the highest increase in cases in school aged children when schools reopened. And we noticed that adults did not increase at the same rate. 
in the USA, we looked at, you know, the, the amount of cases per children. They were looking at 12.7%. Last year in Ireland, cases were 14%. And that changed, and I suppose, at different periods of time, that went up to 17.8%. We also saw in, um, with the different age groups going over and across, it was the 5 to 12-year-old age group in Ireland that seemed to be having the highest increase, followed by 13 to 18-year-olds uh, and then the 0 to 4 year olds this was the frightening thing for me though, the hospitalizations, because we know that children weren't tested that much. What we found in the second period was that there was more, more hospitalizations in children after schools reopened than there was in adults. And we found that school aged children had a higher increase in hospitalizations during that period of time. This is one of our better indicators hospitalizations because our data is so limited. This was the one that kind of concerned me the most. As you can see there, um, it, it was definitely the children and I suppose our underage that were getting um, the more hospitalizations afterwards. We also then looked at educational settings and in every single area from week 32, which is the beginning of the second wave, you can see educational facilities hit the top. They rank the highest in the number of outbreaks, the number of cases and the number of cases associated with an outbreak. And within educational facilities, schools were ranking the highest in outbreaks. Over a lot of weeks of periods, you can see there that schools were um, having higher cases um, that, or higher outbreaks and clusters, I should say, than hospitals, residential institutions, nursing homes. You can see when schools were closed and you can see the peak um, just there coming into October midterm break and then going into Christmas, it's starting to rise again. And you can see over there, like schools are surpassing many other industries, restaurants, cafes, hospitality, even community outbreaks. Now, Outbreaks, of course, you know, we, we, we don't know there could be two to whatever, but there were 1,234 cases associated with outbreaks in schools. You can see here, this is the rise in the peak. There's your childcare and your universities and our schools are rising, rising, rising. But we couldn't actually do what Dr. Deep, he was able to do, which was to look at what happened in the middle of those periods because we had too many different types of interventions. As you can see, we had lots of different lockdowns happening with midterm breaks, um, opening and closures, but we also had a change in close contact definition in November and our close contact tracing broke down because, in my opinion, they weren't resourced well enough by our government uh, to be able to uh, keep it going. But we had a change in definition. So if I were to analyse what happened between October and December in children, I wouldn't be able to do it appropriately because there were far too many interventions and it wouldn't have allowed me to, to give a true picture. What we did know that was that even though we were mass testing in schools, we found that um, there was only about one, one to two percent of uh, the population schools in Ireland were being uh, tested compared to the general population. We also found there was a number of weeks where the positivity rate in schools was higher than that in the community. And on those weeks, if you go back on the media, you'll find a lot of the words that were used were uh, positivity rates in schools are stable. But when they were lower, they would say positivity rates in schools are lower. So it's really important that they say it exactly as it is. Um, one of the big things in the school reports were that uh, we kind of found out along the way that facilities was actually the number of index cases and that the mass testing wasn't actually on um, a whole school. They didn't go into schools. It was actually based on only close contacts. And I felt I feel the messaging of that needs to change. And it's very important that it does change. Um, so a lot of what we found was very alike um, what I suppose Dr. Deepti was showing us earlier on. And we were looking at, you know, a high increase in cases in school aged children. And we were seeing very similar patterns, not just in the UK, but over um, over across the world. But because of the type of studies that I do, which is listening to people's experiences and what they have to say, um, I reached out to an amazing group in Ireland called Alert and Parents of Outbreaks. And they're big into transparency and openness and informing people about cases, because that's a really good way of keeping cases down. If people know it's there, they'll take extra mitigations and they'll be safer. So they started sharing validated letters um, from, from schools and from parents explaining, you know, there might be a case in your school or there is one here. Um, we asked them, could they help us? And they did. And I said, could you do a survey? I just want to ask people some questions. And um, we also asked Isabel Flanagan, a really great young person, leading search student, uh, could she engage with uh, students across Ireland to see what their views and thoughts were being in school? So and, uh, the parent, Alert and Parents survey conducted, they have over 127,000 members. 
uh, 2,800 responses came back. Um, 17, only 17% of people said they felt skills were safe. Um, 2,783 responses were validated and 38% of 1,065 people said they were definitely in a room with a positive case for more than 15 minutes and 67% said they were not formally contacted or told by the HSC or the school that they were close contact. That to me is extremely dangerous situation because we know the guidelines are if you're in a closed environment that you are a high risk exposure. More worryingly, of those who said they were in a classroom for more than 15 minutes with a confirmed case and were not deemed to be close contacts, 64 people told us they went and got tested themselves and subsequently tested positive for COVID-19. 64 people is a lot of people to test positive that could have been walking around to schools. They're just some of the testimonials. They're all on the report. You can read them yourselves. Some of them are really, really um, sad. Some of them really upset me because it came too close uh, to my home and to some of the people we dealt with. Testimonials from students, you know, squished into a small room, not being told there were cases where, where the town knew before the school community. This isn't something that we should have in Ireland in relation with an, a global pandemic. So this is our guidelines and what we're told on our website is, you know, cases of COVID are much less common in children. Generally, children generally get a milder infection. They have no symptoms. They don't spread the virus. Basically, children are immune to COVID is essentially what you're reading there. Um, but yet it was really strange because just a few days before schools reopened, the HSE released their own serum prevalence study that was done on 12 to 18 year olds uh, and adults over that age. And it showed their own words. There was no difference between age groups. So I don't know why this wasn't put on their website, because all children are children, regardless of ages, once they're under 18. I'm not going to repeat this because Dr. Duty kindly did that for us, but it did show this. Children aged 2 to 16 are more likely to bring the virus into a household and more than twice as likely to spread it to others in a household. This is why when we talk about children in schools and risks, we can't just talk about the child. We need to talk about the school staff that's with them. They are an adult. They're with children. Children go home to adults. Teachers go home to uh, their children as well. It's a whole connected system. We can't just focus on children. Um, and Dr. Nisri Nalwan, another a brilliant epidemiologist we follow, um, children can transmit it to others in the community who can get ill, and we need to do everything in our power to prevent that. This is the ECDC definition of close contacts in skills. So you can see the red box, who is in a closed environment. Um, uh, anyone who's in a closed environment is a high risk exposure, but it's very, very clear in the little box under it. Students and staff who have shared a classroom with a confirmed case and during the same time period are high risk exposures. There's no kind of in or around about that. However, our HSE definition is a little bit unclear there, but basically um, you may be, but if you're wearing a mask or if there's good ventilation or if there's good infection prevention controls measures, you may not be deemed a close contact. And to me, that's just absolutely unacceptable. So the current situation, Dr. Deepy explained the situation, but they were very, very clear. And remember, Ireland, ECDC is in our, our Irish statute in our new amended act as our advisor. They're in our governance structure with NEFIT. We should be following ECDC and WHO guidelines. They have said we need to increase all mitigations and skills. There are increased risk of hospitalizations. In Ireland, we have no maths in primary schools. We also have huge risks of our school buses that are overcrowded, which are unsupervised. We don't have windows at each seat. So this needs to be changed. Two meters distancing is non-existent and one meters distancing is also non-existent, especially if you're putting children at tables. There's no distance in there at all. This the CDC, WHO, ECDC are extremely clear that these mitigations need to be in now. We need fewer people in our classroom. We need way better ventilation. I'm not qualified to talk about ventilation, but I'm sure there are others here that can. And we need regular mass screening, testing all the time on the ground to make sure that we're catching any of those cases to prevent infection. Schools are only safe as a community and right now the community in Ireland is not safe. It's just not. We've got too high community transmission and we have this new variant coming in. And after listening to Paul Dempsey earlier on, I'm feeling a lot more nervous um, about the situation now with skills opening. I want you to go to the report. Some of these quotes are in there. They're absolutely brilliant. These are from people we have followed, people we trust, people 
that know what they're talking about. Um, and these are people that we believe that our government and the scientists in Ireland need to um, listen to. And after hearing comments last night on, on television, which uh, said that children are, um, it's rare that they get that from our national emergency team. I have to say I was more than disgusted. I, I actually felt terrified for anyone listening to that and believing that. Hello. Children get sick from COVID and I don't want any child to get sick. Um, I don't want children to go through what my children went through um, and they can go through that. Okay. Uh, Evidence well, I'm, I'm allowed to interject here, but we need to leave space for the next speakers and for some oh, questions as well. It's been a really fascinating presentation and I think there's going to be Brilliant. a lot of questions that come from it. So apologies for my interjection, but I just want to make sure we can get as much contribution. No as problem. Happens. Okay, um, and I might move on to the next speaker if that's okay. Okay, brilliant. I'm going to move on to the next speaker and then come back to all of us some questions following that. Our next speaker is Dr. Louise Gallagher, a neurogenesis and chair of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Director of Research and School of Medicine at the Trinity College Dublin. Through both her clinical work and her research, Dr. Gallagher works very closely with children and young people with devel developmental conditions and their families, and she's going to share the insights she has gained on how COVID-19 and skill closures impact children and young people with developmental disabilities. So Dr. Gallagher, would you like to begin? Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, am I muted or can you hear me? No, we can hear you. Good. Um, and you can see my screen, can you? We can, yes. Great. Okay. Well, thanks um, to Claire and to ISAC for the invitation to speak and to highlight the needs of children and young people with developmental disabilities. So this is a group of children whose needs are maybe discussed intermittently in the media, but maybe, you know, they're the full breadth of their needs um, in relation to school and health services might not be apparent to everybody. Um, I'd also just like to say I'm not an epidemiologist and I'm really just going to talk here about the clinical impacts on kids due to school closures. Um, and how important it is to ensure that whatever steps we take, we take in society, um, that you know that we we can do our utmost to to ensure that the the needs that um, of this group and their school access is protected. So whatever it takes. Um, and if that requires zero COVID, um, uh, you know, um, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I think whatever we can do to support uh, these children to to get to school. Um, so I just wanted to say a little bit about neurodevelopmental disabilities. These are conditions where there's impairment in development or in the uh, or growth in the brain, and it's. It, associated with different kinds of conditions with um, delays in access of skills uh, in the motor, social, uh, language and cognitive domains. And um, examples would include things like um, autism, uh, intellectual disability, ADHD. Um, and these are conditions that very often occur together and we call that that they're comorbid. Uh, so you might often see intellectual disability with autism or ADHD and autism. And that means that the needs of these kids can be complex and they are often require multiple services, which can make um, their, their healthcare needs a little more complex as well. So why is it um, how, I suppose, just to realize how common and impactful uh, developmental disabilities are, although they're individually rare, um, collectively, they're very common. Um, so we estimate that about 18 million people in the European Union have a neurodevelopmental disability that would include people with sort of later onset conditions like psychosis. Um, but if we think about um, Ireland, about two to three percent of the population have an intellectual disability, according to the National Council for Special Education, about one in 68 children have a diagnosis of autism. Um, and looking at autism in particular, it's a complex condition um, that's really associated with very high cost of the individual to society and economically. Um, so in 2014, um, a, a joint analysis of healthcare costs from US and UK data uh, showed that aut autism is the costliest medical condition, more costly than diabetes, stroke and heart disease. And the bulk of these costs are broader costs that are associated not only with providing therapies, but also social care costs and educational supports. And notably, autistic people and people with other developmental disabilities have extremely high rates later in life of being unemployed, socially isolated, and at increased risk of death from a range of uh, medical con conditions, including suicide. Um, so I just wanted to give a little bit of context. So 
Um, in Ireland, provision of services to people with developmental disabilities is guided by policies related to disability and to some extent mental health. So progressing disabilities is, uh, the, is the guiding policy, um, which is a policy that um, uh, of reform in disability services to provide a better access to services and fairness and to have a more collaborative approach with families. Um, the rollout of progressing disability was first written 20 years ago. The rollout has been really slow and quite heter heterogeneous and prolonged, not least of which was due to the recession. Um, and um, there are also significant delays. Um, so not just in accessing interventions through um, health services, but also in relation to diagnosis. So a process known as assessment of need, which is focused on defining the needs of the individual to plan their care. Um, is very, very delayed. Um, so uh, currently then children face, children and their families face long delays in accessing assessments um, and, um, you know, uh, and all, almost vanishingly, well, a lot of delays and, and challenges um, in accessing appropriate healthcare services. Broadly speaking, uh, children and young people with developmental disabilities require inputs like speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, physio, uh, psychological and behavioural in interventions, and then on an intermittent basis, psych psychiatric and paediatric assessment and intervention. Um, and what's important to understand in relation to COVID is that many therapies like SLT, OT and psychological interventions are provided in the school setting, often by the therapist in consultation with the school staff. So, um, just then to talk about um, educational uh, provisions um, for children with developmental disabilities. So um, every child should have an individual education plan that supports their learning and development. Um, children and young people with developmental disabilities um, are considered as having special educational needs um, and they should be provided with resources in line with their IEP. Um, and the school system in Ireland is focused on the ethos of inclusion for all children and young people, irrespective of their diagnosis. And what that means is, uh, that there's a heavy emphasis on mainstreaming, um, although that is a matter of debate among researchers and practitioners as to what works best for children. Um, but in the Irish school system, children, uh, ch children and young people may attend either a mainstream class, and here the child might follow the mainstream curriculum but might leave the classroom to access support for learning in relation to their academic or socio-emotional needs or have a special needs assistant to support their learning in the classroom. Um, they may be attending a special unit which is specific to autism or intellectual disability in a mainstream school or they may attend a special school that's autism or ID specific and the latter two typically operate with about six children in the classroom and a teacher supported by maybe two or three special needs systems um, and here the cur curriculum will be adapted and frequently along, uh, run along a model of education that's designed for children with autism. Um, and um, they often have children across the whole IQ spectrum from profound intellectual disability right through to children with normal cognitive functioning. So there are it really within that group, there are children with very heterogeneous needs and levels of functioning. And I can just say in relation to some of what we've heard discussed to do with social distancing and other mitigations, they are really not possible in this context um, because these many of these children will require help with their personal needs, with feeding, with toileting, um, or, or even behaviourally, they might need to have uh, people come close to them at times. So you just can't do social distancing. And these children will not frequently uh, tolerate mask wearing, although so, some, some children who are higher, uh, have, you know, better cognitive ability um, uh, can adapt to, to mask wearing. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, children may be accessing their HSC supports in the classroom, um, but also special schools and uh, some special classes frequently fund fundraise privately to backfill gaps in service provision. And that might include providing mainstream therapies like SLT, OT and behaviour therapies, but also leisure activities like therapeutic horse riding. And in special schools, uh, frequently, uh, the curriculum includes social activities in the community as part of the curriculum to promote engagement and to develop um, adaptive skills. So, um, sorry, oops. Um, oops. So just to talk about pre-COVID access to education. So the National Autism Charity As I Am uh, conducted a survey a number of years ago that highlighted 
that there were already barriers for children in accessing uh, their education if they had autism. So about 17% uh, of parents in a parent, in a parent report survey reported a reduced timetable. 13% of them reported that their children had missed up to three years of school in total. And this was both children in primary and secondary school. Um, and in terms of um, the reasons for exclusion, um, so behavioural needs was a key problem, a key issue. So 66% uh, reported that anxiety, their child's anxiety was the main reason why children were experiencing exclusion. Um, and 52% thought that knowledge and understanding uh, was, was a, a, a contributor. And about a third cited inadequate supports currently available in schools. So already prior to COVID, uh, there were barriers to education for children. So what happened post COVID? Well, once the schools closed in March, Children uh, with developmental disabilities, like all children, did not formally return to school until August, September time. And that represented six months without access to their usual educational and therapeutic supports. Um, so not only did they use normal school time, many of these children would access extra summertime education provisions called the July provision. And um, that's either done with a teacher at home or a program in school. And Therefore, normally the school year might extend from kind of late August, early September, right through to mid or end of July. Um, and really in August, uh, in any given year, August is a challenging time for families um, where they have children with developmental disabilities. And, but in 2020, August effectively started in March and ended in September. Now, alternatives were offered and these included Zoom calls and work being sent home. Um, but um, Inclusion Ireland conducted a survey on barriers to remote education for children with special educational needs. And this, you know, parents reported that their child's ability to learn at home, um, uh, obviously parents working at home and having another child at home to learn, like most parents are experiencing that. But 11% of the children had no form of any technology for learning and only 56% had access to high speed broadband. And that really is for those children who can use that form of technology to engage with education. Um, so um, in terms of uh, clinical services as well, a number of things happened in clinical services as well that impacted on service provision. So staff, a lot of staff were redeployed around the country to test and trace. And that was particularly think people like OTs. We also had um, nursing staff who were providing respite care of getting redeployed into residential settings, because obviously it was very important to protect people in residential settings. Um, but that meant that initially there were limitations on respite and home support, which is an important social care provision for, for people uh, with developmental disabilities. Now, the HSC did run a traffic light system where they could highlight which uh, individuals were most at risk. And there was a lot of emphasis, I know, in my own area where I work on trying to ensure that um, it, private providers could be provided perhaps for things like home support. And, well, more particularly respite home support was a little bit more tricky because of the need to prevent mixing between households. And a lot of parents felt uh, very anxious about welcoming somebody into their home uh, from another household. Um, so virtual consultations were also offered um, in the disability setting in, in CAMS with so child psychiatry. Uh, that was more of a mix of face to face and virtual consultation. But the biggest challenge, as I've already mentioned, was that service providers lost their service provision model. So uh, therapists who were accustomed to attending the, the classroom to consult with teachers were unable to provide consultations on a routine basis. So again, you know, things like video consultations, home or school visits when school during the periods when school were open and then in person uh, appointments if, if necessary. So what were the main impacts then on uh, children and young people that we know so far? Well, there's not a huge amount of data on these type, uh, you know, on, on children in this group. Uh, but there are a few lines of evidence. So some of it is anecdotal. So I'll tell you a little bit about my own experiences and other therapists within our service. And um, then some of it is derived from an international survey that we've been doing that's looking at the impact of coronavirus on people with autism. Uh, and then um, there's been an advocacy survey that was done about the during the return to school um, in October. Um, and that looked at sort of barriers there and parental preferences around school. So just like back in March, obviously, we really started to engage with families very quickly to try to understand what resources and supports they might need. And initially, you know, parents often reported that their kids were doing OK um, in March and April. And school can be a really big stressor in the lives of children with developmental disabilities. So some children were happier at home initially there was the you know the reduction in pressure life became a little more predictable there weren't people coming in and out of home 
uh, and that's something that can make life um, easier for children with, with developmental disabilities, particularly children with autism. Um, but then um, there was a pattern of increasing phone contact from about May onwards um, uh, because of reducing structure. I suppose the novelty was wearing off. The day was getting very boring and children were understimulated. Um, and um, there was a lot of increase in, I suppose, you know, um, anxiety and agitation. And really, by August, anecdotally, a lot of parents were at the end of their tether. But what, what evidence do we have? Well, the Coronavirus Health Impact Survey was uh, initiated uh, to um, at the NIH, the National Institute for Health in the US by Dr. Kathleen Mary Kangas, a psychiatric epidemiologist and psychiatric epidemiologist um, together with Dr. Agari Stringaris. And they approached a number of autism um, specialists uh, led by a colleague of mine, Dr. Adriana DiMartino, also formerly a colleague of, of Claire's, uh, Dr. Claire Kelly. Um, and we got together and adapted the survey that they had developed for typically developing young people for people with autism. Um, and the survey aims to assess the needs and changes related to coronavirus uh, in individuals with autism and other de related developmental disabilities. So um, there are various there are surveys of parents. Uh, there's a self-report survey and an adult report. So, so far, I'm, I mean, the, I'm not going to show a lot of data because the analysis is ongoing, but there um, uh, we're focused here on the parent report data. So there are about 15 sites in North America and Europe who participated, about 1,500, uh, almost 1,500 individuals in total, and uh, almost 200 individuals from um, Ireland were included. Um, and the uh, profiles in terms of the diagnosis, blue represents autism, Green is ADHD and blue is other. And you can see that predominantly a lot of the children had autism, but this would be with a mix of it, of with and without intellectual disabilities. And then the next largest group would probably be those children with ADHD. Um, so um, the only slide, this was a slide that, um, that this data really jumped out at me initially. Um, it's just part of the initial analysis that we've been doing. Um, and uh, the main thing really I want to show in this slide is this is concerned with how children access different kinds of services in the school environment. So if they never got it, you'll see uh, cream. If the service was lost, you'll see red. And if it was modified in some way, you see this kind of orangey color. So here is uh, the Trinity site here. So this is uh, the Irish respondents. Um, and what you'll notice reflects what I've been saying already is that many parents were reporting that their children were not getting a lot of these therapies already pre-COVID. So very essential services like speech and language therapy and occupational therapy were not being received. But of those who were receiving them, you'll see that the red sort of slices of pie are quite large as well, that there were a lot of them were just lost in the school environment. And that could well be because schools, I, we don't know why, but it could, one explanation could be because, you know, the, the uh, schools were paying for those privately with private therapists or also because the HSE therapists weren't able to go into the school environment. And you can see that really uh, the modifications uh, in, in terms of um, therapies were also very, very small, uh, with the exception perhaps of maybe a quarter receiving modified education therapies. So a massive loss of services in school, and you'll see the same thing recapitulated for their services outside of school. So already saying that they weren't getting a huge amount of therapies outside school. Now, this actually surprises me a little bit um, that it's so large, but of course it's a convenient survey. Um, so it may well be, you know, that there are some selection biases in the data, um, but it's still very concerning to see that children weren't getting things at baseline and what they were getting, they were losing, perhaps with the exception of, of medical services where it's a little bit more important to continue to provide those. Um, so we just had a quick look at... Um, uh, uh, we wanted to look at the, uh, in our Irish data and see what impact loss of services had on the behaviour in children and young people, particularly because behaviour was seen as such a big barrier to accessing school for, for so many children in a prior survey. 
Um, and we saw that loss of services significantly impacted disruptive behaviours and irritability, which is very hard to cope with um, for parents, and also anxiety and hyperactivity. Um, and, you know, this was by a factor of almost four. And this really indicates to me that children are not managing well and that service loss tied to school and health service loss are adversely impacting on their behaviours, which in turn may impact on their return to school. So what data do we have about the return to school? So sorry, I just this is just captured from the advocacy survey that was done by As I Am, Down Syndrome Ireland and Inclusion Ireland. Um, and basically, I think they um, surveyed about 382 people, about two thirds from secondary school and about a third from primary school. And this was in October when kids were supposed to be back at school and already between the 5th of October and the 19th of October, 4% of children hadn't returned to school at all. Many children were transitioning between primary and secondary school or into new school placements and 33% of them got no support with that. Um, and although there were, there were positives and negatives about the return to school, so this group of parents are very strongly, you know, advocating for their children to get back to school. Um, but children were losing things that might put them at greater risk of being marginalised, so they weren't getting access to integration. Uh, they, uh, many were still experiencing reduced timetables. There were problems with transport. Many children have to travel quite far distances to special schools or classes because they're not always available in their own communities. Um, they were losing SNA allocations, maybe because they were getting redeployed because of staff absences elsewhere. Um, and they were losing things like reasonable accommodations. And this could be things to help them cope with sensory difficulties in school, like movement breaks and so on. So they made strong recommendations about really reinstating all the things that children need in, the, in school when schools are open. Um, obviously, this is not taking account of, you know, the concerns ab about transmission in school. This was done more focused on the needs of those children. Um, and um, I think um, one of the so there were kind of two aspects to the recommendations. One was to make sure that the mitigations for or the, the supports the children need in the classroom were still made available to them. But on the other hand, um, was to highlight that mitigations are not really going to work for these kids in school either. So things like mask wearing um, and social distancing and so on. So there needs to be other ways to think about how to deliver education safely to these children. And um, I don't have recommendations around that because I'm not an epidemiologist or I'm not an infectious disease expert. Um, but I suppose just to conclude then, um, right at the start of COVID, the ESRI in Ireland uh, did, did a report where they predicted that children with additional needs and those from socioeconomic disadvantaged backgrounds were more likely to be disadvantaged through COVID. Um, and I think we see here a group of children who are already disadvantaged pre-COVID in terms of clinical service access and education. Um, you know, there's been a huge loss of, of investment in disability services throughout the recession that has never been recovered. Um, COVID restrictions, loss of school and health and social care services, we're seeing a deterioration in mental health and well-being for children. Um, and in the return to school, we're seeing the loss of many of the necessary supports that they need to remain in school successfully um, and increases in practices that could further marginalise them in school. Um, so going against our, the ethos within the school system of mainstreaming um, and actually further con contributing to their risks of, of social isolation. Parents want their children to be in school. So in the, as I, in the advocacy survey, about 80% said they wanted their children to be in school. Now, it was at a different stage. About 20% said they had children with, um, with, uh, um, uh, who were vulnerable and needed to cocoon. And they wanted access to at-home therapies, if their at-home education, um, if their children couldn't be at school. Um, and I suppose it, re it really remains to be seen what the lo longer term aspects are going to be. Um, we're all aware that there'll be cutbacks in public services in the future when we begin to focus on recovery. And so my message, therefore, would be that we have to do everything that we ha can to protect access to services and education for this group of children to ensure that in the longer term, their needs are not ignored or deprioritized. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to stop sharing now. That's what Dr. Gallagher, thank you so much. Uh, it was a really fascinating in-depth presentation. I should note for, we have 104 participants still online at the moment. We have been consistently over 100 for the last hour. We are running a little bit behind, but I actually think that's okay. I think these are conversations and analysis that have, to, have to take place. And if we're running a little bit behind, it's probably because the conversation is long overdue. So I'm just gonna keep going and the discussion can be as in-depth as it needs to be at this point. 
So I will now pass over to Dr. Gabriel Scali, who is the President of Epidemiology and Public Health Section of the Royal Society of Medicine and Professor of Public Health at the University of West of England and the University of Brit Bristol. He's a member of both ISAG and the Indy Sage in the UK and a vocal proponent, proponent of evidence-based approaches to the pandemic. He's going to talk about why we need to follow the science for safer skills. Dr. Scali. Gary, thank you very much for that uh, long introduction. I'll try and be, I'll try not to be as long as that introduction. Um, I, and I will keep it short. It's a really important issue and uh, there is so much to say about it. And I think it should be noted that ISAC will be producing a discussion document uh, very, very shortly, probably today, uh, with nine, a nine page discussion document, well referenced, which will deal with um, many of the issues, many of the key issues and I think should form a really good basis for uh, public discussion because these things need public discussion. I agree with the, uh, uh, the Director General of WHO who said, Dr. Tedros said, schools should be the last institutions to close and the first to reopen. And that is often quoted. What is less often quoted is that uh, he also said, um, during the time when schools are closed, that time should be used to put in place um, measures to prevent and respond to transmission when schools reopen. Now that is just as important. And I think there is a question, how much effort has gone into making our schools COVID safe? So what do I mean by COVID safe? Well, I think there are three key elements uh, that should be taken into account. One is uh, a very important statement is that sick people should not be at school. Uh, there's a very nice, uh, uh, the Norwegians talk about having a, a kind of a snot index of how much snot is too much snot for a child to go to school. And those are the sort of fundamental questions uh, that need, we need answers for and we need to be providing uh, guidance. We need an Irish snot index. Children will get uh, colds and sniffles and parents need to be able to know when it is safe to send them to school and when they should probably keep them home. And it, I mean, it's generally clear that if it is merely colds and sniffles and there aren't other um, uh, problematic symptoms like a cough or like a, a fever, and if the child isn't generally well, well then it's generally okay. But these things really should be part and parcel of the interaction between the educational system and parents. Um, there also needs to be very clear guidance what happens when people uh, fall ill at school. Uh, because children spend a high proportion of their time at school when, they're, uh, when they are fully open, there needs to be some understanding of what should happen if a child or a, or a member of staff, and it's not just teachers, I think far too often we just talk about teachers, but it's teachers and other members of staff as well, if a member of staff or a child falls ill and what should happen. And then uh, how that should be dealt with in terms of uh, uh, the other the other people who have been in close contact with that person that and that should be codified and we should all know that and then uh, there also needs to be guidance about what is someone in the household is ill or and there are two different things what ha should happen if someone in the household tests positive and there should be that is not for me to be pronouncing on now but this is the sort of information that should be absolutely uh, at the fingertips of, of every parent and every family. Um, I think the second point I want to stress is the importance of good hygiene. And that was stressed a lot at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, as we moved on to a better understanding of the virus and understood that it could be uh, aerosol transmission, could be distributed by air movement essentially, rather than droplets, which was our main focus at the beginning. The emphasis has gone off hygiene, but good hygiene remains a, a core issue. Uh, and that means having soap and paper towels at wash stations, putting in new wash stations if there aren't enough, uh, because uh, I'm very clear that they, there has been, uh, just as in our hospitals, there has been over the decades, uh, a reduction in the attention uh, being given to, to washing hands and general hygiene issues. Um, there should be training for all pupils in how to wash their hands properly and cough suppression as well. And there should be hand sanitizer freely available for children to use if they can't get to a wash station or if there aren't enough convenient. 
So good hygiene, and those are just some of the examples, is absolutely important as well to be a core element of reopening schools safely. And the third issue is about reducing uh, contact between people. And that means between staff and pupils, between pupils, uh, between uh, uh, pupils and other uh, maybe parents collecting or bringing children to school, etc. And it's really important. Uh, and, and some of these measures will depend upon the level of cases that there are in the area and uh, ISAG uh, and uh, will, I think, be uh, following uh, the UK independent sage view that, that, that we indeed an independent sage got from other countries that we do need some sort of traffic light system for schools. To, so to be able to say what the level of, um, of precautions are, are needed, uh, whether children should be cohorted all the time or not. Uh, should they, uh, the number of teachers or staff who, inter who um, interact with that cohort be limited or not? Um, should there be segregated play areas for different cohorts and play times for different cohorts? And should arrival and departure times uh, be staggered? Um, but one of the most important things I wanted to stress was larger spaces. Uh, larger spacing is so important that someone mentioned two meters, if, if anyone remembers when we were supposed to do two meters. And we should be emphasizing two meters much more now than we do at the present time. And we do need larger spaces. And it's one of my disappointments is that I haven't seen anywhere in these islands a major program to take over extra space, to take over community halls or sports settings uh, or commercial buildings or whatever, to provide more space so that children can be in bigger and bent better ventilated areas. And that includes setting up marquees or temporary buildings in school grounds or in playing fields or taking over uh, playing fields in order to put them up so that children can be educated. And that brings me to the, the key issue of uh, ventilation. I think ventilation is absolutely crucial. And uh, I, I, I'm, I am really surprised and disappointed that so little attention has been placed on, uh, first of all, assessing the level of ventilation in every classroom. If you were a parent of a child in the public school system in New York, you can go online and you can see every school report and you can see on uh, for every school a report on every space in that school, whether it's used for teaching or not. And you will see for a teaching space that your child is in what the level of ventilation is. Is it when do, does it have windows? Are the windows opening? Does it have supply fan, i.e. blowing air in from outside? Does it have an extract fan taking air out? Does it have a mechanical ventilation? And what is the quality of the filters? And you will know that for your child. And there is a program of works to address the classrooms that fall short. Why do we not have this approach in these islands? I don't understand it. Ventilation is absolutely crucial. Um, and I've, two things I wanted to mention. One was, um, one of the things that highlights for me is the decline in uh, educational uh, public health. We uh, have had a lot of attention, and rightly so, and I've been one of the people who over the decades has, played, uh, has put a lot of emphasis on uh, improving the, uh, the, the, the capacity and the quality and the expertise and the reach of our public health uh, uh, doctors and public health nurses in Ireland and improving that system. Rather than that, we've seen the system in serious, in serious decline, and I hope that will be reversed. But one of the things that has really changed in my lifetime is the amount of attention that is paid to educational medicine. When I was a boy in a primary school on the Falls Road, the, 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 the least prosperous part of Belfast that was, uh, we had uh, uh, child health examinations carried out on every child to detect illness and to uh, make sure that the child was growing properly and not being neglected. And all of that infrastructure of educational health has uh, been uh, swept away. I know in, uh, in, in England, where I live now, that at the, in 2010, there were 3,000 school nurses left, 3,000. I know by the time the pandemic started last year, that had fallen to 2,000 school nurses. And they, that is a, a hugely inadequate number. And we need to look again at educational medicine. It used to be so important. 
and local areas had a, a, a local medical officer of educational health, as well as having a medical officer of health dealing with the general health of the population. There was a period of time when every place had a medical officer of educational health. And that's something we should, we should be looking at this whole issue of educational medicine really seriously once again. And finally, I just want to say that we need to be very cautious with uh, and, and really oppose this notion that once we uh, vaccinate all of the highly vulnerable people for, because of age or underlying conditions or whatever, then it's all right to let the virus rip. And th the reason I say this and I mention it often is because I, in my public health training, I learned about uh, Spanish flu and the pandemic of a Spanish flu. And I also learned about this, the association that was drawn between Spanish flu and Parkinson's disease in decades afterwards in the United States. Now, it wasn't possible to prove a direct connection that one caused the other, but they were undoubtedly related in some way. Here we have a highly dangerous virus, which we know has neurological con uh, uh, consequences. And it, we, it is unacceptable, in my view, entirely unacceptable that anyone should uh, think that it is sensible to let young people get infected with this virus when we can avoid that. We don't know what, what awful things this virus might have in store for us in the future. So I think uh, the protection of the health of uh, our children is of crucial importance. Thank you very much. You're muted, Gary. Apologies. Thank you, Dr. Scully. And thank you, Dr. Scully. We are approaching the 90 minute mark of this um, conversation, a really important conversation that I think factored in a lot of massively important points. I should say that in relation to some, most of the questions that have come through, most of the questions that have come through have a particular team of why and seem to also include the Department of Education. And I think it would be unfair for me to ask the scientists who have been advocating for particular approaches why they haven't been implemented as policy. But I, it's a massively important issue. There is a team of ma one of the kind of the more um, it's become almost a cultural taboo in Ireland at the minute. It's the idea of masks for children. And could any of, our respond, any of our contributors talk to the importance perhaps of mitigation and touch on some of maybe masks for children and so why that's important and so why we're advocating that and how maybe we can get that into the public consciousness of this being an important mitigating factor. And also, Olive, if you want to finish your presentation, if you want to have any concluding remarks in your presentation, feel please feel free to do so now. Um, Dr. Scully, I'm going to bring Gary, you... In the absence of anyone else, I'll, I'll put my head there. We, we, actually, uh, we could actually do the behavioral scientist to answer that for you, because uh, what the behavioral scientists tell me is that there is no reason why children above the age of six shouldn't wear masks and that children will adapt very, very quickly to the wearing of masks and do it very, very well. And uh, I, I am at a loss to know why um, this is not being considered. And in my view, we should be um, providing high quality masks, uh, uh, especially uh, for children size masked, uh, masks as well. We mustn't repeat the notion or the problem we had uh, it, with PPE for hospitals that they uh, didn't fit women. Uh, the masks uh, uh, men's faces but not women's faces so I, I, I believe strongly that we should be providing proper masks for children in school uh, but uh, it has to it, it's it has to go alongside a, a whole range of measures it's just one of the whole uh, range of measures and we mustn't get tied down into an argument about any one of those measures uh, because that will distract us from the full range of measures that we really need to see introduced Thank you. I could probably um, add uh, very quickly on that uh, as the behavioral scientist, I suppose, of the group. Um, and, and I agree with what Gabriel said, and it's not clear why we have resistance to uh, children wearing masks in Ireland. Um, although I suppose we might remember that, you know, a year ago, there was some resistance to um, grown-ups wearing masks too. And there was some mistaken um, beliefs that, that originated in behavioral science that, you know, people wouldn't be able to wear them properly. They'd be touching their face all the time and so on. And, and we've shown that, you know, adults can learn how to wear masks properly and so can children. And children have been uh, children in um, primary schools, so from age five, actually from age two in the US, so children even in preschool settings wear masks. 
um, children in uh, Canada, I think from age five and France from age six and throughout Europe, um, primary school age children are wearing masks. And so, as Gabriel said, it should be part of a suite of mitigation measures. It's not, a, you know, a, a solution to everything, but, but we believe it could help substantially with uh, um, a reduction of cases in the school setting. Thank you, Claire. Just to add a small point to that, um, to just illustrate how behind we are in the mask conversation, um, I think, well, certainly in the UK, possibly in Ireland as well, um, compared to many other European countries, we're still debating about whether masks should be used in primary school settings when other countries at this point in time are talking about grade and type of mask used in those settings, particularly in France where FFP2 masks are now being suggested for use in those settings. So, I mean, those are important conversations to be had. We can't have those conversations until we get the basic measures in place. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Daisy. Jerry, you're saying you have your hand up there trying to come in. You want to come in? Sure, yeah. Just with um, my experience with population-wide public health measures is that the kids are always pretty straightforward. They're, they're adaptable little people. Um, they're more used to being told, you know, do A, do B. Adults, uh, are are more difficult. We all have better, you know, we all have longer established sense of what's normal. You know, when I mean, we bounced our kids around all kinds of strange environments and they all adapted, but adults, we, we're slower to change our minds about things. And then just a practical thing about, you know, masks for many of us, but particularly for kids, is a cloth mask does just doesn't tend to ride up on the face or down as much. And so if kids want to talk and not have to readjust their masks, often a homemade cloth, cloth mask can, can really be quite convenient. Thank you, Jerry. Olive, I did interrupt your presentation. So have you had any concluding remarks you wanted to make or any any points you, you left out? Please feel free to come in now. Uh, thanks, Vinny, Gary. Uh, just with masks, my uh, three-year-old has been wearing a mask for the last year. She doesn't go very many places, but when she does, she wears her mask and she's well able to do it. So um, it, it can be done. Um, I suppose just to kind of finish off what I wanted to say, um, what we feel is very important. The first most important thing that we believe is that we have to invest in our public health because until we do that, we're not going to get the mitigations or the testing or the tracing or even the policies. We really, really need a massive investment in our public health departments. And with that, in, in coercion, our education system too, because our principals and teachers or staff are trying to meet them halfway to do all this stuff. Um, the other things I think is important, I suppose, we do need a policy change. You know, we can't have this thing where people are going home scared and hearing secrets that there's cases. We can't have that because that's impacting on people's mental health then. And we're supposed to go to school for good mental health, not the other way around. Um, the other thing I would say is mitigations. Um, we, we just have the largest class sizes in Europe. There's no way of getting around that. And the only way to get our physical distance is by giving people the choice to remote learn from home. And I know there might be lots of ins and nuts and bolts, but it can be done or at least provide funding so people can homeschool. So people think homeschooling is easy. If you're a low income family, you can't afford the fees that go at homeschooling. So at least if give people the choice, but also give them the resources to do that. And what I will say is, I think um, when we, and that's not just for people with health conditions, I mean, all people were in very dangerous times and we're being asked to go into somewhere where this different rules apply. So I really believe that that's for everybody. The last thing I'd like to say is in relation to um, mental health, you know, um, I never got to say, I don't know where a quote is, but we'll get it up on the, on Twitter. Uh, Zara Flynn is a counselling psychologist. She's part of Parents United and she spoke about the mental health um impact she was just saying that no two children are the same and yet we're treating all children as if, if they're not in school that that's the worst thing in the world for them that's not true i have a 17 year old doing applied math since last october and she's thriving i have another girl who's not but the point is no two children are the same so i really believe that we need to give that choice and at the same time it'll bring down class sizes um, and thank you for having me on <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you all. Um, unless uh, so representative from OISAG want to come in and tell where we can get the presentation, I presume this video will be available later on. Yeah, yeah, Scary. So I'll um, I'll 
we'll make put this up on the our YouTube channel and you'll be able to access access it through our website and we'll also be sharing that discussion paper that Gabriel referred to um, so people can you know potentially we can share that with um, unions if that would help with uh, um, schools um, you know that we're, we're providing the, the scientific evidence and, and I guess we have to leave it to to those who have the contact with the De Department of Education um, to advocate for these mitigation measures to be brought in. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. And I suppose there's also an onus and a responsibility in all of us who've now been empowered with this information to carry that forward, to um, lobby your policymakers, to advocate in, we're in their community. So I think to echo the information and the learnings that we've taken from today. I think there comes a responsibility with that. It's only in the last minute we've dropped under 100 participants in that call. I think each one here has a responsibility to go off and convince other people in relation to the mitigation measures and the science that we've just heard as to why it's important and for this now to become part of our public policy. I think that's absolutely essential. So I am going to bring the meeting to a conclusion to thank all of our contributors, our four contributors, for what has really been an excellent presentation, an important contribution to the debate. So thank you all very much and I look forward to meeting you all again in future, in a safer future. Have a good day, folks. Bye-bye.